Hi, everyone. This is a brief introduction to the basics of critical thinking, uh, which should serve as the foundation for um, any um, class that attempts to study philosophy or uh, any individual who attempts to study philosophy. Um, we're going to go over some of the basics of uh, what an argument is, uh, what it's composed of, the difference between a good argument and a bad argument, um, and uh, also talk briefly about some uh, mistakes in reasoning that um, are commonly made, so known as fallacies. Um, so to start with, uh, philosophy is all about providing arguments in defense of certain ideas or claims. So by an argument, we do not mean um, having some sort of dispute or fight with someone. Uh, I mean, that could be involved, but the term argument is um, a, a logical term that refers to a set of reasons that are given um, in support of a certain claim. Um, so for example, if I want to argue that um, that free will is an illusion, that no one has free will, for example, that's a philosophical position someone might adopt. If I just express that idea, if I make that claim, then um, I'm just expressing an opinion, right? And I can do that if I want, but nobody has any reason to agree with me. They might or they might not. But if I just say, hey, I don't believe in free will, I think it's an illusion, um, you might say, interesting, um, so what? So if I want to um, do some serious philosophy, then I need to provide reasons why other people should agree with my claim. So in other words, I need to provide an argument that defends the idea that, uh, in fact, we do not have free will. And then it's up to uh, my listeners, if they care, uh, to try and understand what my argument is and to assess it, to ask, okay, is it a good argument? Um, now, uh, an argument is composed of two main parts. Uh, I'm going to go in reverse. The first part I'm going to talk about is the conclusion. Um, that is going to be um, what comes last in an argument. Um, logically, it, it doesn't, doesn't really matter, um, <clears throat> but it makes more sense that way. Uh, usually in an argument, the conclusion is going to be the last line, the last claim. But the important thing for us is that uh, the conclusion of an argument is the claim, the statement that uh, one is trying to defend, that one is trying to support or prove, uh, to back up with reasons. So in the case of my example, my conclusion is that uh, free will is an illusion. If I want anyone to agree with me, I better provide some decent reasons for them to come around to my way of thinking. Um, <clears throat> the second part of an argument, the main part, um, is composed of what we call the premises. So uh, a premise is just a line in an argument, a statement that uh, ends up supporting or attempting to prove uh, or to back up, you might say, the conclusion that one is arguing for. Um, so if, again, my conclusion is free will is an illusion, um, well, what would my premises be for that? Well, there's a bunch of different possibilities. I might appeal to, um, I might appeal to uh, research that's done in cognitive science or in psychology, and I might say, well, look at this study. It um, should people believe that they have free will, but uh, there's something about the uh, setup of an experiment that shows that um, actually people aren't as free as they think that they are, um, because we can maybe predict what their actions are going to be, even though it feels to them like they're free. Um, I'm not saying that's a good argument, but just an example um, of information that I'm giving that you can kind of see, yeah, if, it's, if that's true, right? if we have an experiment where um, we can show or at least provide evidence that we can predict people's behavior, even when they feel psychologically as if they were free and could do whatever they uh, chose to do, then that's some evidence that, yeah, it's just an illusion. It's an idea that we have in our minds, but we're not really free after all, perhaps. Um, <clears throat> take a more uh, mundane example. So um, let's say I want to argue that um, my neighbor is um, a nice guy. Um, that, that's not true or anything, but, but imagine it was. Uh, my neighbor's a nice guy. Um, that's my conclusion for my argument. How am I going to back that up? Well, I got to give some premises that support that conclusion, that um, 
make it at least likely that the conclusion is true. Uh, so I might say, well, he uh, you know spends his spare time um, working for different charities. Um, he uh, forgave, um, say, a big debt that somebody owed him to give them a chance to get back on their feet. Um, you know, they're kind to animals, right? They give gifts to people. Um, they never cause problems in neighborly disputes or anything like that. Um, I'm just making up stuff here. Um, but you come up with a list of reasons that you um, present then to somebody else. And the idea is, if it's a good argument, the other person, the one who's listening to you, can say, yeah, I could see how if all those premises were true, then the conclusion would either have to be true or at least is likely to be true as well. Uh, your premises back up um, the conclusion. And that's uh, what makes in general for a good argument. Um, there's much more detail we could go into here, but hopefully that the basic idea is, um, is pretty clear, that an argument is just a set of reasons that support a conclusion. Those reasons we call uh, more technically the premises, and then the conclusion is the, uh, the main claim that you're trying to back up, what you're trying to prove. Um, so um, a brief word about what uh, premises and uh, conclusions can be. So uh, I've used the word claim so far. Uh, so a claim is any sentence that can be either true or false. Um, so that includes a lot of things, but not everything uh, that humans can say. Um, examples of claims, two plus two equals four. Uh, that's a true claim. Uh, two plus two equals five. That's a false claim, but it's still a claim. So remember, a claim is just any statement that can be evaluated as either true or false. It can be either one. And in order for it to be a claim, you don't even have to know whether it's true or false. So, um, for example, the claim that um, there's life on, um, on some moon in the uh, solar system. Maybe there's microbial life on um, uh, one of those moons out there we haven't discovered yet. It's possible. Um, I don't know if that's true or false, that there's life out there, but there either is or there isn't. Uh, so there's either life on Europa, for example, or there's not. I don't know whether that's true or false. Maybe someday we will know, um, but it's still a claim. But whatever it turns out to be, true, correct, or false, incorrect, um, either way, it's still a claim because it makes a statement about the way things allegedly are, what, what is true. That's what it means to make a claim. I claim that um, I was not at the scene of the crime, or I claim that uh, there's life on Europa, or I claim that uh, free will is an illusion. Those claims are either true or false. Uh, sometimes we know, sometimes we don't, but they're still claims regardless. So um, in an argument, a proper argument the composition is always a set of claims. So every premise has to be a claim and every conclusion has to be a claim. And remember that just means that every uh, premise and uh, every conclusion in a legitimate argument has to be uh, evaluated as either true or false, has to be capable of being either true or false. Um, now you might ask, well, doesn't that just include everything? Uh, but if you think about it, there are examples of things that we say that are not claims. So, for example, questions. I can ask the question, is my neighbor a nice guy? Um, and if that, that can be a genuine question, I don't know the answer. Or maybe I think I do know the answer, but I still pose the question. But if you think about it, uh, you can't really say that the question itself is true or false. It just doesn't really make sense. Those concepts just don't quite apply to questions. Um, so um, is, uh, is the sky blue? Another question. Um, well, it is sometimes. Um, so my answer might be a claim. Yes, the sky is blue. That's true or false, depending on the day. But the question itself, is the sky blue? Um, I'm not making a claim about the way things are, right? I'm not making a statement about what is true. I'm just asking. And it doesn't really make sense to say, well, that question is false or that question is true. 
it might be a bad question for some reason, depending on the circumstances, but falsehood and truth just don't really apply to questions. Another example would be um, what's known as imperatives or uh, sometimes called commands or orders. If I say, um, go to the store and get me a sandwich, I'm telling you what to do. And that might be not very nice of me, right? Might be kind of rude, but it doesn't make sense to say, hey, your uh, order or your request there is false or true. Again, if you think about it, uh, truth and falsehood really only apply to statements that attempt to describe the way things are. If I say two plus two actually equals four, that's, that's a claim about what's true. If I ask the question, does two plus two equal four? That also um, is, uh, or that is not um, an example of something that can be evaluated as true or false. Uh, or if I ask somebody or request them, go find out for me whether two plus two equals four. Well, that statement that I'm making, again, is neither true nor false. I'm just telling somebody to do something. <clears throat> um, okay, so quick review so far. Um, in philosophy and really any discipline that attempts to um, study the way things are, or what's true, so this also goes for the sciences, um, we're dealing with uh, arguments. Uh, what an argument is, is a set of claims. Um, the first part we call the premises. The last part, the second part, we call the conclusion. The conclusion is the claim that you're trying to prove or support. The premises are the claims that you use to try and back up the conclusion. Every argument has to have uh, one conclusion and um, at least one premise technically, but any useful argument is going to have usually two or more. Um, so typically, um, you know, technically you could have a thousand premises in an argument, but that wouldn't be very uh, useful. It'd be hard to get your head around that. Um, so a lot of times um, with uh, arguments when it comes to um, some of the, uh, the normal kinds of philosophical questions, arguments regarding them, you'll usually see something like uh, two to four, maybe five premises and a conclusion. Um, uh, so, okay, so that's what arguments are. Um, a brief word on uh, two different types of arguments. So it's common in, um, in logic classes and um, in thinking about arguments generally, to, to divide arguments into two different types. So on the one hand, you have what's called um, a deductive argument. And on the other hand, you have what's called an inductive argument. Um, so a word of warning, um, don't look up <laughs> what these are uh, just with a, a quick um, uh, online search or something. Uh, because there's a lot of uh, misconceptions about what inductive and deductive arguments are. And, um, you know, the, the terms get used in some different sorts of ways. But but here I'm, I'm going to tell you the way it's used um, when um, uh, we're talking about logic. So by uh, professional philosophers and um, and other folks who have, or at least supposed to have, a, a better grasp of what, what these terms mean. Um, so deductive reasoning um, or deductive arguments, uh, reasoning and arguments, sometimes we can use interchangeably, but deductive arguments refer to any argument that attempts to prove the conclusion. Um, we'll come back to what proof is in a second here. Um, <clears throat> that's my neighbor. Uh, whereas inductive arguments, um, refer to uh, any argument that attempts to support but not prove the conclusion. Um, so I'll say a bit more about each of these. Um, but um, inductive arguments or inductive reasoning is what you'll commonly find in the sciences. Um, not 100%, but um, a lot of times. And deductive arguments are what you'll more commonly find in uh, philosophy, uh, but also in um, mathematics and um, uh, things of that nature. So more uh, abstract um, <clears throat> sorts of um, uh, areas of inquiry. Um, so, so that's just fine as a, um, as a starting point. Inductive reasoning or inductive arguments are those that attempt to support but not prove their conclusion. 
whereas deductive arguments attempt to prove their conclusion. But what's the difference between supporting and proving? Um, so let's start with inductive arguments. Uh, when you try to support an argument, uh, sorry, support a conclusion, um, what you're doing with your premises is trying to uh, show that the conclusion is probably true, that it's likely true. Um, so you provide um, premises that give evidence that back up the conclusion. And if it's a good argument, then you can say, well, given that all the premises are true, it's very likely, or at least somewhat likely, that the conclusion is true too. But this is crucial with an inductive argument. It's always possible that all the premises are true and they do support the conclusion, but it turns out maybe that the conclusion is false after all, even though it's unlikely. Um, maybe there's some evidence that we overlooked, or maybe the evidence in a given case is just very misleading. Um, so that's my, that's my dog in the background. She's, she's upset about the neighbor. Um, <clears throat> so that's what supporting a conclusion is. Um, when it comes to proving a conclusion, which is what you attempt to do in deductive arguments, there the goal is to have premises that if they're all true, then the conclusion must be true. So in a deductive argument, again, if it's a good one, if it doesn't fail, then the premises make it the case that if they're true, which is sometimes a big if, but if the premises are all true, then the conclusion must be, 100% has to be certain. Uh, it's certain that the conclusion is true because the premises are. So that's a big difference. Remember in inductive arguments, the premises could be true, but it's still possible for the conclusion to be false. Whereas in deductive arguments, that's not possible, at least with a good argument. Um, in a deductive argument, if the premises are all true, then the conclusion must be true as well. So there's there's no um, there's no escape room there. Um, escape room, something else. Uh, but there's there's no wiggle room there. There's no way to get out of it. Um, <clears throat> So just a couple quick examples. So uh, an inductive argument, um, I mentioned that these are common in the sciences. Uh, so the way science works, at least in most cases, or when it's working well in, in most, um, most of the uh, individual sciences, uh, researchers provide evidence to back up uh, certain ideas. So right, they have a hypothesis, uh, they run some sort of experiment or do some sorts of observations, and they uh, come up with a study and they write up this paper and try to get it published in a serious scientific journal. And let's say the paper gets accepted, it gets published, and somebody in psychology, for example, or some research team um, ran some big survey, right, where they uh, talked to dozens of people or hundreds of people maybe, and um, saw how people answer different questions under different circumstances. And maybe that supports the idea that um, you know, people are more likely to say certain things under certain circumstances, right? So, you know, I don't know, you change the temperature in the room or something, if it's hotter or colder, that might change how people answer the same question. Um, and then you can maybe, maybe you can draw some sort of conclusion from that. Um, but you can sort of tell this is just an empirical study, um, which isn't bad, but even if it's a well done study, um, it's possible that um, it could turn out that what the evidence in this study suggests to be true, so the conclusion of the researchers, it might not end up um, holding up to scrutiny. So maybe another study is run that attempts to replicate the results, and maybe it doesn't. Um, and that would cast doubt on the original study. You might say, well, were they really finding uh, something interesting, or was it just a fluke? Maybe there was a flaw in the study, um, something like that. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? That's just the way science works, that um, you're supposed to uh, test different ideas, right? So it's not like one study comes out and somebody says, hey, we have evidence that something is the case, and everyone says, okay, now we know that. Rather, real scientists see that as an invitation to, um, to question that and to study it further. And sometimes uh, additional studies provide evidence to back up the original conclusion, the claim that the first set of researchers were arguing for, Sometimes not. Um, so in that case, we're dealing with inductive arguments, right? We're just gathering evidence that um, supports a conclusion. And that evidence can be weaker or stronger. 
And so inductive arguments themselves can be weak or strong depending on the uh, quality of the premises. Um, so you might have a very weak inductive argument that's just um, got some pitiful evidence in favor of the conclusion. You might say, well, that kind of suggests the conclusion might be true. It's something, but not very much. Whereas on the other hand, you might have mountains of evidence that um, overwhelmingly support a certain conclusion. You can say, yeah, that conclusion is very, very likely to be true. It's always possible that some future evidence could throw it into question, but um, it's pretty close to rock solid. Um, so that varies, varies a lot depending on, on what the subject is. You can also have inductive arguments in everyday life. Um, so uh, you're trying to figure out um, you know, what, um, who, who took the, uh, you know, the, the last beer from the refrigerator or something like that and uh, nobody's admitting to it. Um, but you might find, okay, there's an empty beer can in my roommate's, um, in my roommate's room. Um, she's been known to lie about this in the past, um, taking the last beer and not admitting to it. She's been caught before. Um, she's getting pretty nervous when we ask her about it, right? Kind of shifty eyes and things like that. So even though you can't prove it, right? That's going to be decent evidence to think probably uh, that roommate is the culprit. They're probably the one who, who took the last beer. Um, it's not a deductive proof, right? I haven't shown with certainty that, yes, it's definitely it must be the case that she's the one, but rather I've provided inductive evidence. It's likely that um, she's the one who did it based on uh, the circumstantial evidence, which um, depending on the case might be pretty strong overall, or it might be pretty weak and tenuous. Inductive reasoning is, is fine. We use it all the time. We need it. It's common in the sciences. Uh, we're typically going to uh, rely on that when it comes to legal arguments, for example, about uh, especially in uh, criminal cases about uh, whether somebody was guilty and whether the evidence is strong enough to support that. Um, but in philosophy, we typically deal with deductive arguments uh, traditionally. Um, not always, again, not 100%, but usually. Um, and like I said, it's also going to be common to find deductive reasoning in um, things like math. So a good example of deductive, a deductive argument would be uh, a theorem in geometry, uh, if you remember those from high school. Um, and uh, you might recall that the way those work is they're supposed to prove uh, a certain idea, right? Uh, so like the Pythagorean theorem, for example, uh, you can work that out to show that um, yeah, this isn't just an idea. This isn't just something that, you know, is my opinion that is likely to be true maybe, but it's something that can be proven using um, the, the logic that's involved in uh, the relevant mathematics. Um, in philosophy, we are typically going to see uh, arguments of the form where you have a set of premises, again, usually something like two, three, four, five of them, and at one conclusion. And philosophers typically will set up their arguments such that if all the premises are true, then it must be the case that the conclusion is true. Uh, so that's a deductive argument. And then it's our job as evaluators to look at the argument and say, is it actually a good one? Does it actually uh, prove what it claims to prove? And there are two main ways to do that. Um, so when it comes to evaluating a deductive argument, first, you want to check the structure of the argument. Um, you want to ask, is the, um, is the logic of the argument, is that uh, what we call valid? So in other words, does it, does it make sense? Does it hold together a, in a logical way? Is it uh, consistent within itself, coherent? Um, there's a lot more we could go on with that, but we'll, we'll just leave that for now since we're just doing basics here. Um, but that's the first step. Uh, well, you could do it in any order. But that's one step. The other step is to ask, are the premises in fact true? Um, and um, a lot of times um, uh, philosophers will supplement their arguments by trying to provide uh, further arguments for the premises themselves. So they might say, yes, premise one is true, and you should believe that because, look, I can prove it with this other deductive argument, or maybe I can support it with some inductive argument. Um, but there are two main components to evaluate, or two main um, uh, uh, steps to evaluating a deductive argument. 
Number one, is the logic valid? Which means, does it hold together in such a way that if the premises are true, the conclusion must be true as well? If yes, then it's a valid argument in terms of the logic. But the next step is to ask, are the premises in fact true? Because if they're not, right, if one or more of them is false, then you might say, well, that's, you know, it's logically well constructed. That's nice. If the premises were true, then the conclusion would be true, sure. But one or more of the premises is false, so therefore the argument fails. Um, I'll just give you a, a, an example of a deductive argument. Um, so, uh, so I'll just make something up here. So uh, premise number one, all dogs are friendly. Premise number two, um, Annabelle is a dog. It's my dog. Um, conclusion, right? Ask yourself, what can you conclude from that? What follows logically? And, uh, well, it must be that Annabelle is friendly. As premise one says, all dogs are friendly. Premise two says Annabelle, in fact, is a dog. Um, so you can see, okay, if both of those are true, then the conclusion must be true as well. So the logic of that, the structure, is valid, right? It makes sense, it's consistent, it flows in the right way. Um, the next step is to ask, are both the premises in fact true? Um, well, it is true, you just have to trust me that Annabelle is a dog, right? If you have reason to doubt me, then that's, that's fair enough, but um, I can't prove it to you, you just take my word for it. Most of the action is gonna be in premise number one there. Is it true that all dogs are friendly? Um, well, I think so, but uh, some people might not agree, um, and that's something we might have a dispute over. So that would be an example of um, something that we might uh, have a discussion about, try to figure out, okay, is it true that all dogs are friendly? Is premise one true? Because if not, if you can show examples of dogs that are not friendly, then that would mean, well, the premise is false, because premise one says all dogs are friendly. That means all. So if you can find even one dog that's not, then that would falsify the premise. And then the argument wouldn't succeed because although it's logically valid, uh, premise number one turns out to be false. Um, so that, that's uh, maybe an open question. We might disagree about whether all dogs are friendly. Um, okay, so we've looked at what arguments are, what they're composed of, what claims are, uh, and two different types of arguments, deductive and inductive. We've talked about what makes deductive and inductive arguments good um, in their respective cases. Uh, the last thing I want to mention is um, the idea of a, a fallacy. So you may have heard this term before. A, a logical fallacy is just defined as a mistake in reasoning. So it's a, a mistake in uh, an argument somewhere. And they can come in many varieties. Um, there's an infinite number of ways that you could make a mistake in reasoning. Uh, some of them are so common, though, that they have their own names. And um, uh, I have some other videos on examples of uh, some of those fallacies. So, for example, uh, uh, the ad hominem fallacy is a classic one. I won't go into details here with examples, but, um, but we want to avoid fallacies, of course. Um, we don't want to commit them ourselves, and we don't want to fall victim to them um, if others commit them. Um, at least on the assumption that it's good to believe true things. Uh, so we want to be on the lookout for that. Um, some fallacies are inductive in nature, meaning that they're fallacies that occur specifically in inductive arguments. Uh, one example would be a hasty generalization. So if I look, for example, at just one or two cases and I generalize from that, um, that's a mistake in reasoning because just because uh, one or two cases of something uh, has a certain feature, it doesn't follow from that that they all do. Um, it might be true that they all do, but it could also be that my limited sample size is um, going to mislead me. I should look at more cases. So for example, if the only squirrel I ever saw running around the neighborhood was a white squirrel, um, which I see sometimes, I might say, uh, well, all squirrels are white, or at least in this neighborhood they are. Uh, because look, I just saw that. But of course, that would be a hasty generalization because that's very uncommon. Uh, most of the squirrels are gray or brown or something. Um, but if I don't look at the other squirrels, if the first one I see just happens to be this exception, and I conclude from that, I generalize and say, oh, well, they must all be that color, uh, you can see, it. well, that's a recipe for making a mistake. Um, 
there are also deductive uh, fallacies. Um, there are, um, again, many um, varieties of deductive fallacies, but a common set would be known as fallacies of irrelevance. Uh, so that's when I use provide some reason uh, as a premise to support some conclusion where the premise is just irrelevant to that conclusion. Um, so just to give um, a uh, just a, a silly example of an ad hominem fallacy, um, suppose my high school math teacher was a jerk, um, not a nice person, and let's say we all agree about that, and they come into class and they say, all right, class, two plus two equals four. That is true. And if I stood up and said, no, that's false because you're a jerk, um, that would not be a good argument, right? That wouldn't be a good um, line of reasoning because even if it's true that the person's a jerk, it just has no bearing whatsoever on whether or not two plus two really equals four. Uh, what this person said is true. And the fact that they're not a nice person is just uh, completely irrelevant to uh, the mathematical claim that they've made. Um, so, as I mentioned, you can take a look at some of the uh, other videos uh, that I've made about different types of fallacies if you're interested in that. There's also many other resources um, online and in uh, uh, books and things like that if anyone likes books. Um, but in general, a fallacy is a mistake in reasoning, and it's something presumably we want to avoid, again, on the assumption that it is good to be logical and that it is good to believe true things rather than false things. Um, I assume that those are um, some good ways to go in life, and if they are, then fallacies are bad. Um, okay, so that's where I'll leave it for now. Uh, just a, a very quick introduction to the basics of what arguments are as um, a start on critical thinking. Uh, talk to you next time. Bye.